Well, hello there, everybody. Welcome back to the channel. Thanks for tuning in again for another weekly update on news and information about DCS World. I'm your host, of course, Prickly Hedgehog, and as always, I do hope this video finds you well wherever you're tuning in from. Let's get into this week's newsletter, which is an exciting one. Lots to unpack. We're going to talk about uh, support for core game engine updates, primarily here multi-core, which I know many of you have been asking about for some time now. We're going to talk about updates to the supercarrier. We have some more news on AMRAM and missile behavior. And we will talk a little bit more about the Apache progress. And there is some discussion here about some campaigns for the MiG-21, a little bit of a plug there. So that will round out our newsletter. If you have been paying attention to things going on this week, you would have noticed several videos from WAGS discussing some changes to the F-16. Today's one discuss uh, setting up a bullseye, which uh, has pre previously not been available. And there's a lot of little snippets coming out of this uh, this aircraft, which is receiving quite a lot of attention. We also saw a helmet-mounted queuing system, excuse me, update as well. So there's a lot going on, and some of the changes that we're going to talk about now are especially significant, especially in the multi-core. But we'll begin with the supercarrier, which has... Uh, not necessarily been lying idle, but it hasn't received any major updates for a while. And there was some discussion about some new bits and pieces we're going to get. Part of those bits and pieces were going to be some more realistic animations for the deck crew, which provide pretty decent immersion, especially when we had years of no animation um, characters at all, if you like. Now we have them, and soon, hopefully, they're going to get some more upgrades. So what are they saying? Well, apparently for the last six months, they've been working on a human motion model with intelligent behavior for infantry and deck crews. They have started with the deck crew, and they're going to scale it over to the infantry units at a later stage. Both logics are going to receive two new behaviors, obstacle avoidance and dynamic reroute, or reroute, depending on your part of the world, according to the situation. Rerouting behavior is based on a path search algorithm with any angle path planning. So pretty cool. Now, obstacle avoidance is based on the optimal reciprocal collision avoidance method used for holonomic robots with several restrictions on linear and angular speed, so they're not going to be leaping about the deck unrealistically. Also, acceleration and discreteness of animation. So again, this is all to do with making the whole thing a little bit more realistic rather than so... Um, formulaic, if you like, one-dimensional, and uh, that is going to be good for immersion. The first phase of the development is complete, and cases must now be considered for when aircraft are passing by, directing aircraft to and from a parking position, avoiding moving aircraft, different states of service and interruptions, etc., etc. So there's a lot of work when you think about that, because obviously you don't want a crew chief who's uh, maybe directing you somewhere or a plane captain at least, uh, then trying to avoid running away from the aircraft while, while they're supposed to be in relative uh, proximity. So lots of things to uh, overcome, I think. And if they are able to achieve this, it's again going to add uh, more immersion, I love that word, <laughs> and when it comes to DCS at least, to what is already a pretty spiffy uh, simulation of, of carrier ops. This is only again going to add to that experience, which is absolutely fantastic. And it will... Really, there's nothing else like it in the um, the sim world right now for uh, aircraft operations and carrier operations. It's absolutely fantastic. Now, as part of all of that, of course, we are going to need some more, I don't know, beef or a little bit more uh, sauce for our CPUs. And as many of you know, there is a CPU shortage like nobody's business right now. It spreads across the entire electronic industry and of course just about everything is electronic these days so the auto industry can't build cars because there's a chip shortage and you and I who are crying out to upgrade our systems can't get uh, you know reasonably reasonably priced CPUs or GPUs particularly uh, without uh, soaring off um, part of your body or prostituting yourself in some way to pay for uh, these things outside of maybe a second or third mortgage. It's absolutely ridiculous. So this is good news. So what they are basically telling us is that the multi-threading support started back in 2019, and they decided to implement several new approaches in Edge 2.7, which is pretty good. I noticed that uh, most of us pretty much didn't get a frame rate drop really or a major performance drop with the advent of 2.7. So that's been a really nice introduction. And of course, we're talking here the, 
the new clouds, the new lighting, and the richer textures that we've got from uh, that particular update to the game. It's been a massive improvement, and I must say it's been welcome. Now, this was required basically to increase performance as rendering demands have changed due to virtual reality. Of course, this is a new technology in relative terms, and uh, Eagle Dynamics are working quite closely with VR right now, and it is a very exciting platform, I think, for this particular genre of games, along with things like uh, uh, sim racing and stuff like that as well. Now, therefore, you have more detailed maps, greater object detail, etc., etc. So you're going to need more processing power to be able to do that. So they devised, uh, devised a solution to render a frame in a multi-threaded manner with automatic workload synchronization. That's kind of a mouthful there. Uh, by the end of 2020, they were confident that they were at least halfway there with a full ready render graph and the required applied programming. At the end of quarter three, 2021, they accomplished the following. This is interesting stuff. So graphic backend, EDM models, human models, atmosphere, water and sea, terrain edge, special effects, particle system, night lights for terrains, scenes, cockpits, mirrors, indication, GUI, post effects, and cascade shadows. Pretty cool. So what's left? Well, this is what they are telling us. Flat shadows, dynamic lights, radars, propellers, and similar effects, clouds and VR support, which is obviously going to be a pretty big deal. So in parallel to this massive work and upcoming modules, we continue to implement the support of the Vulkan API. We have completed most of the work for a first delivery and made changes to our internal applied graphics uh, API that can shield out the Vulkan code whilst in early testing. This render code supports both DirectX and the Vulkan API as different DCS world branches. So lots to unpack there, and I only understand snippets of it. Those graphically orientated people or programmers and those who work with um, um, that part of the industry might be able to provide a little bit more insight. So please feel free to post your comments below. I'm not uh, a programmer. Um, I'm not a real pilot either. So um, all of this is, um, you know, uh, I'm, be, I'm visually absorbing this. Uh, what does it look like in the game? I understand that, um, but I don't understand the, uh, the some of the technical terms that they're referring to there. But uh, for those of you that do, uh, feel free to put in your comics and give us some insight. All right, well, let's turn now to major changes to the AIM-120 AMRAM, which has received a separate INS, or Inertial Navigation System Unit, with data link support. The INS will steer the missile to the predicted target intercept point using targeting data received from the weapon control system at launch. This will dramatically increase missile effectiveness against non-maneuvering targets when the missile has no guidance prior to its seeker taking over the intercept. The aircraft weapon control system will also send INS messages via data link that updates target position and velocity to account for target maneuvers. Interesting. The missile seeker model has been completely revised. So the radar dish now uses a realistic gyro stabilized gimbal that is controlled by the INS before target lock. Okay. Uh, an active missile seeker, like in the AIM-120, will have its detection and tracking lock range based on physical calculations of noise and target signal ratio, which in turn depends on target RCS or ECM power and, of course, range. Target search and tracking is based on Doppler velocity filtering, introduced uh, realistic velocity gate, apparently, and the radar will search for target near uh, or targets near the target reference velocity provided by the INS. So that's an interesting update. And the guidance law was also updated, so therefore the missile seekers have received Kalman filters that estimate target motion parameters. This uh, new guidance law accounts for target normal to LOS accelerations, loss of sight accelerations, uh, possible target G-load growth rate, compensated missile X-axis acceleration, and missile control system latency. That's going to be interesting to see uh, in-game and what the missile behavior looks like as a result of those changes because that basically is, well, at least it sounds like it's going to be a whole new missile. So let me know what your thoughts are on that. I'm sure there will be some people perhaps potentially unhappy by that. Uh, or about that in terms of um, um, some in-game performance and what it means uh, as compared to other weapons. But uh, if this is a mimic, if you like, of more real-world physics and locking characteristics for the missile, then that can only be a good thing. So again, let me know what your thoughts are. That's very, very interesting. 
Okay, well, speaking of very complicated uh, pieces of equipment that are integrated on our various modules, uh, this one, of course, should be no surprise to anyone, and that is the pilot and co-pilot gunner helmets for the Apache AH-64D, which are, in their own right, very complex pieces of equipment. Uh, these are going to be integrated with some new detailed pilot models as well, so no surprise there, Eagle Dynamics has really pulled out all stops. Not only does the aircraft look good from the exterior, but the internals that we've seen as well also pass muster, and now we're going to get these very realistic looking pilots with these fancy helmets, which is really cool. Remember that uh, this will, of course, hopefully be available at early access launch. That is the plan at this time. And they have some development screenshots to accompany the things that they are referencing here. We are talking the integrated helmet and display site system, the integrated helmet unit, the helmet display unit, the communications components, the armor works, and this helmet mounts. We have the night vision goggles, which are M949s, the ITT Anvis 69 low profile battery pack, the NVG counterweight bag. We have a lip light, a boom microphone, a type ML8, and an extra bag for battery pack with Velcro. So lots of detail there, lots of equipment on a, you know, a very complex piece of uh, hardware that integrates with the obviously the weapon system of the aircraft and also some of the avionics systems so some pretty complex stuff that's been worked on as i said eagle dynamics is pulling out all stops remember that the aircraft is currently available for pre-order in the eShop and it will be available for early access i am told as early as early december so uh, unless I'm being misinformed, but that is not far away. We're talking a matter of six weeks or so. So stay tuned for more information on that because I think there's no question this is going to be a popular seller for Eagle Dynamics. And they've done a nice job, not only of uh, modeling the exterior, but they've gone to a lot of attention to detail in the interior as well. And the subject matter experts out there like Casmo TV have really given a lot of praise to the work that's being done and showcased for this aircraft so you know a, a real fan favorite for uh, many of you in the community so stay tuned because i think it's going to be a good product and i can't wait to get my hands on it just like you let me know what your thoughts are on that all right well let's turn to a quick plug here for a couple of campaigns for the MiG-21. So this will round out this week's newsletter. In this case, we're referring to the Battle of Krasnodar campaign by Sorrel Rowe and the Constant Peg campaign by Bunyap. And okay, as I said, these are for the MiG-21 fishbed. Now, I don't own the fishbed or any of these campaigns, obviously, so I cannot therefore testify to their quality. But if you do own the MiG-21 and you have had some experience with these campaigns, maybe uh, throw your weight to the value of them. What I do know is that uh, the third party campaigns that are being produced by various people uh, and companies across the platform are absolutely fantastic. We're seeing an increase in volume of really good campaigns and also a high quality product that's being produced. We're talking professional voice actors and some quite sophisticated types of missions and sorties to fly. So that's really immersive, especially if you're a single player that uh, can't or won't or, you know, is just not interested in, in multiplayer uh, type performance. And it gives you a nice, uh, you know, way of getting into the game and having some fun because that's what it's all about and having that immersive experience and, and getting shot down from time to time. A uh, little caveat on that too, uh, some of the campaigns now you would have noticed in game have or should have an ability to skip over missions that you've already completed or are not interested in flying again or want to skip to another portion of the campaign uh, just by skipping ahead. And this is a new feature that was introduced recently by Eagle Dynamics and they are talking about uh, improvements to that as well and other features may be part of that. I would imagine at some point we could also see the ability to save in game. At this time it's not available uh, because the replay system, the way it works and all the rest of it, the, um, um, the track files and things, um, they're not always reliable, they can become corrupted, etc, etc. So I don't think it's ready yet, but I would imagine at some stage, based on what they are describing, this could become a feature of the game uh, and I think it's a necessary one, especially because 
you have a lot of players that don't have the time to fly, you know, two or three hour missions, for goodness sakes. Um, most of us are only playing for 20, 30 minutes a, a night if you're a full time worker and have kids and a wife and family and all the rest of it. It's not possible sometimes to really take advantage of the um, enjoyment of long, um, long sorties and the challenges that brings. So uh, the ability to save in game or even skip over these missions as I've described is a real big bonus. I think not only for the player, but it also means I think that some of the campaign developers will have the option to create missions where you are able to save it and allow the player to come back and carry on from where they were. Uh, to complete that sortie or you know whatever the mission was um, and not have to refly the whole thing which is the case at this time so stay tuned for more on that let me know what your thoughts are again um, a nice little plug for some you know aircraft that uh, don't necessarily get the high profile uh, news if you like but uh, nonetheless uh, fan favorites out there by many of you so all right well Thank you for tuning in again. Thanks for uh, the likes and subscribes. And I really, really, really appreciate it. My mouth's getting a little bit dry. I just forgot to bring water with me here. So um, I apologize. But uh, busy weekend for me. And next weekend, I am taking a little break uh, to spend some time with family um, before the you know Thanksgiving Christmas period so I apologize I'm not sure if I'm gonna have a video out uh, next Friday or I'll have some sort of uh, cinematic for you or something to enjoy as a as a you know substitute for a uh, video you be quiet there I'm not quite ready to finish yet um, so let's wrap it up uh, stay safe out there everybody carry on flying and I'll see you next time this is Prickly Hedgehog out cheers